You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So, as you would probably expect, today we are not doing what I said we were going to do. It's really weird. I usually stick to a real tight schedule here. We run a tight ship here. Um, yeah, but we're going we're gonna to go ahead and call an audible. Uh, first time ever. And we're going to do some other stuff because lots of stuff is going on. I did have one thought. That's similar to what we've been talking about the last two days, but I promise it's one last thought. It's going to take about four seconds and we're moving on. I'm uh, going to talk about a, a ton of, of different uh, news and notes that have been going on in, uh, in Green Bays. A lot of activity. Probably most of it doesn't mean very much other than, well, th- that's not good for our team. But then I actually... I, I, I was kind of thinking about it, and it's like, I, I, we don't really have a lot of time after we talk about this to go into pro football focus, and I don't want to split it into offense and defense, because I just don't want to take that much time breaking down a team that just, I mean, who cares? We lost. It was miserable. Everybody was bad. You know that. I want to tell you what you need to know and, and move on. That, that's a good, solid day. Offense, defense, special teams, that's a day. But it's, it's not a half day, and it's not a two day, so we're going to go a different route. And what I want to do which I'm kind of excited about because I love doing different things because I do a lot of the same things over and over and over and over and over literally every day. I want to look at some of these playoff contenders. I want to kind of use my magical pro football focus predictive powers and talk about some of these other teams, not just for fun, like, ooh, I'm going to predict who wins the Super Bowl, but for two reasons. One, I want to talk about these teams in general because... I don't know if you know this, but our ability to... Oh, we got an early dance party, ladies and gentlemen. Get up and get down. Um, What was I talking about? Our ability to win a Super Bowl has a lot to do with the competition around the NFL. So kind of understanding these teams kind of does have an impact on the Green Bay Packers. right? We saw from 2017 to 2018... A lot of volatility, and that seems to be the case now. It used to, I feel like, maybe I'm just in la-la land, I don't know, I feel like things are a little crazier than they used to be. I don't remember quite as much like, oh, this team's garbage, oh yeah, and then they win a Super Bowl, and then they're kind of garbage again, but now they're kind of good again. I mean, it, it's, it's not just volatility from year to year, it's like, from the, the Colts were pretty good, and then it was like, oh wait, they're not good, and now it's like, oh, they're going to win the Super Bowl if they get in. It's like, whoa, wait, whoa. <laughs> that's, that's three times. That's supposed to happen like once every two, three years, not three times in a season. So, I mean, it, it, volatility is not just year to year. It's like you, you get two teams in the midst of a year. Dallas Cowboys, ha, 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 you're trash. And then, oh, man, they're dynamite. And now it's kind of like, wait, maybe they're trash again. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe we'll get a fourth from the Cowboys and they'll come back and win a Super Bowl. But anyways, let's look at our competition in the future, what are these teams right now? What do we think they're going to be by the end of the year? What does that tell us about going forward? Beyond that, we've got some competition in teams that we don't necessarily like, like the Saints, because of the draft pick. Otherwise, I like the Saints. They're fine. Uh, the Bears and the Vikings, who I would like to lose immediately. In fact, I would like it if the Vikings don't even make the playoffs and we don't have to worry about it. But let's just take a little look-see at how things are going. In part because I think sometimes um, narrative kind of just gets stuck. We just kind of think a thing about a team like, um, you know, the Saints have a great offense, terrible defense. And that's just the assumption. And it's, it stays that way until, like a, until somebody nationally makes a proclamation. And then there's a big fight. And then it takes it like a week for it to like really stir up. And stats get thrown out. And everybody keeps fighting against it. Not because they know but because it's the narrative. No, 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 they have a bad defense. It's like, no, no, it's good now. No, it's not. You're crazy. They don't have, they, they never do. It's like, no, I'm telling you. Statistics, look, this thing, check this out. And then after like a week of turmoil, a narrative can change. So we're going to go through that process a little bit, right? Rams, it took us a while to realize maybe their defense isn't good anymore. And uh, maybe it's going to take us a little bit of time, but they might be good again. 
except their offense might not be good anymore. So going to be a lot of earth-shattering revelations going on here. But I want to talk about it to try to get an idea of what exactly teams are. Because, again, Bears are the same situation. Great defense, terrible offense. Well, I don't know. Let's take a look. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? How about the defense? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? I don't know. All I got is narrative. And it's kind of wedged in there, kind of stuck. But that's what we're doing today. But first, let's talk preliminaries. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you'd like to support the podcast. There's also a link in the description of this podcast for a one-time donation. If you'd like to go that route, I would be greatly appreciated. All my hard work vindicated by your money. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, showing up every day and listening is nice, but I mean, you know, I'm like a terrible spouse. (laughs) Do you love me? Yes, I do love you. Okay, then why don't you spend money on me? What? Yeah, I mean, mean, you do stuff for me, but I don't see a lot of money coming my way. I'm just saying. I feel like if you love me, you buy me stuff. I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm that guy. (laughs) Packernet.com for all your news, notes, and information. I really do like... I think I've made good choices here. I decided to start a podcast, and I really think what I'm doing is I'm doing it the right way. I like the way this podcast is set up. I like my podcast as compared to other podcasts. I made a decision over a year ago because I realized I don't have enough time to do Packernet and some other... I was writing for other Packers websites, and I was like, i got to make a decision. Now, there were other bigger, well-known websites where I can get my reputation out there and, like, I'd get a ton of Twitter followers, but I'm like, I don't know, man. I like Packernet. It's older. It's got history. It's been around since... Like, it was literally purchased, I think, a month after Packers.com was purchased. It's like the, it's basically the oldest Packers website in the world. Just, just missed it by like a month. It's got the history. It's, 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 it's awesome because it's just, it's an aggregator. It's got all the news you could want. I just, I was like, you know what, I'm going Packernet. I like Packernet better. I'm not going to get all the fame and fortune and all that, but it's just, it's just a better website. So listen, when I say Packernet is the number one website, it is the best website, I'm telling you that because I believe that. And if I didn't believe that, I'd still be writing for some of the bigger named Packers outlets that you know of and are aware of. You know, the people jump on, start writing, and a month later their, you know, Twitter following is six times higher than mine, and, you know, they're getting all these fame and fortune and all that stuff, and that's cool. I went a different way, and I like my path. I think it was the right path. Speaking of the right path and the best website, NFLBigBoard.com, again, if I'm not going to create the best one, probably just not going to do it. I'm just, I, listen, I'm just not interested in being one of a thousand. I just, that's not my thing. I don't care. If I do stuff, I'm going to do it because I'm going to be the best at it. It's why I have the best podcast. It's why I work for the best website. It's also why I created the best draft website. Again, I built what I felt was what I always wanted. That doesn't exist, right? Like, there's other cool sites that do, like, cool stuff, but I got to do a lot of work to try to figure things out. It's like, okay, so I go here to figure out who the best prospects are. But it's kind of weird because you go there and then you go somewhere else and you don't know who to trust. Like, I I like Draft Tech because it's a huge list. I don't know if they're a bunch of dummies or what. I kind of figured out I don't care for CBS too much, but sometimes they're right about stuff. Then you go over to Walter Football and he's got some weird takes like, who is that guy? I've never even heard that guy's name. And then you go, I don't know. And then you got to try to look into stuff, which means you got to go all over the internet, and you got to go on Google and look it up, and you look up a, a scouting report, and you don't know anything about it. And then you got to go over to YouTube and try to find videos. I got all that stuff crammed into one website, and now like an hour of work gets condensed into like five minutes. Everything you need to know news notes, information, highlights, video clips, an aggregation of. You want to know where they rank across a bevy of quote unquote the experts? NFLBigBoard.com got it for ya. Feeling good. Making good life decisions. Something I, uh, something I haven't always been able to say in my life. <laughs> Otherwise, one final thing. I did start up uh, my YouTube stuff again. So I've got uh, a first-round mock draft up. I've got a seven-round Packers mock draft up. And then there's a couple older videos uh, that are a little outdated. But I'm going to be trying to get those up as regularly as possible. Obviously, you know me. If I could do daily, I would. I would love to be able to do teams daily and then once a week do a you know seven or a first round mock. Unfortunately, until this becomes my career, which might be when I retire, uh, that's probably just not possible. But I'm doing it. I'm grinding. I'm getting the work in. 
Uh, Pack Daddy NFL is a channel if you wouldn't mind checking it out. Not that you care, but a pretty long and grinding emotional experience. It was literally a year ago when I met YouTube's criteria to start getting paid. Like, I mean, the channel just blew up. It was awesome. And then, then they changed their criteria in January, and it's like, oh, you need this now. It's like, oh, come on. By February, I met that ridiculous criteria. Took forever. That was when you need to get up to 1,000 subscribers, so I just kept grinding. I got up to 1,000. They're like, all right, it'll take a week. This is after they told me in December it'll take a week, and then a month later I find out, oh, no, we changed the criteria. Then they're like, okay, it'll take a week. It, it, they said a week. Usually a week it'll take. They kept telling me, sorry, we're backlogged. Give it another week. Literally for a year. And then one week ago I got an email saying, hey, guess what? You're approved for advertisements on your videos now. So it's been a long road, ladies and gentlemen, but I made it. And so far, your man has made six bucks. <laughs> oh, I can taste retirement. I, I feel like I make good life decisions until I realize how hard I work and don't make nearly as much money as a kid with a paper route. But, you know, whatever. Whatever. He gets fresh air. I get to talk football. We all make our own decisions in life. I mean, if you're in it for the money, fine. Get a paper route, I guess. Anyways, let's get started. So the one thing I'm going to talk about real quick that kind of dawned on me, and it's not very different than what we talked about, but in a similar vein to the whole, you know, why it's important to start Rogers, sit Rogers, etc., I, I, I just want to, I'm just curious, I guess, what the, the benefit of beating the Jets is. And I, you know, I, I know not a whole lot changes, but I just want to think about this from the standpoint of what a lot of people are saying about, you know, you don't quit, you don't do this, and, and how a lot of people are talking about the things that happen this year carry over into next year, which I don't necessarily believe all that much. Again, I think the biggest thing is that winning solves everything. If you want to build a team, if you want a cohesive locker room, if you want a good attitude, if you want all this stuff, that's what happens when you win. If you want a bad attitude and all this stuff, that's what happens when you lose. There's a funk in the locker room. Why? Because it's the team's losing. It's not going to get fixed until the team starts winning. The, the high volatility of the players just kind of means, you know, whether you, how high the highs get and how low the lows get. But you're always going to be high when you're winning and, and low when you're losing. But regardless of that, let's just think this through real quick. So we, we start Aaron Rodgers, and, you know, we, we got uh, some other people that are put on IR, which we're going to get into, and we beat the Jets. Now... Wouldn't it necessary? Wouldn't it kind of be an expectation? Aren't the Jets one of the worst teams in the NFL? I say one of. I understand they they have some talent somewhere, but I can't imagine that's a game where national media looks and says, "Whoa, check out the big brain on Brett!" Right? This is this is not a big earth-shattering moment. This is less significant than beating the Falcons. So nobody cares. And I can't imagine the Packers' locker room really gets super jacked up. But let, let's just look at it from another standpoint, because we've talked about uh, some of the negatives of playing Rodgers, such as, oh, I don't know, we win, we lose our, our draft position, right? So that's not good. Aaron Rodgers gets hurt. That would be an absolute catastrophe. But how about another negative of winning the game, or losing the game, which is the fact that we just lost to the Jets, not just lost to the Jets, but we lost with Aaron Rodgers. Look at how bad things are right now. National media and, and about 50% of Packer fans are just fed up with Rodgers and are coming down hard on Rodgers. He's garbage, he's trash, he's this, he's that, blah, 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 blah. How bad are things going to get if we play Aaron Rodgers and lose? If Aaron Rodgers, he lost to the Bears. The Bears are one of the best teams in the NFL. The Bears' defense is one of the best defenses. It's, it is the best defense in the NFL. And as I said, we haven't seen a defense like this since, like, the 2014-15 Seattle Seahawks, whatever. And this is what happens. This is how Packer fans and the national media react to Aaron Rodgers after losing to the Bears' defense. We're talking about the Jets now. How bad is it going to be for this team, for Aaron Rodgers, to lose to the Jets? It's going to be bad either way, but if we lose with Aaron Rodgers... I mean, I, I we're, we're talking rock bottom here, folks. I mean, losing to the Cardinals at home is about as bad as it gets, but it's just, this is, that's ugly. So, uh, another unnecessary, so so it's, it's just lose-lose. It's lose, if, if we win and nobody gets hurt, 
best case scenario, all we did is lose our draft position, and we're drafting instead of 11th, we're drafting like, I don't know, 15, 16? Depends which teams lose and which teams win that are ahead of us, or behind us, or however way you want to look at it. Which, by the way, if I may interject for just one second, for those that don't really understand the implication of winning and losing, do you know how bad it is that we lost to the Falcons? <laughs> just looking at it from from a draft standpoint. If we were 4-9-1 and one instead of 5-8-1, and one, we would be currently number 6. We would be 6th instead of 11th. 6th with the potential of having a number 1 overall draft pick. Probably wouldn't get it, but we would be 6th with a, with a, with a potential of a first-round draft pick. Right now we're 11th with the potential of, I don't know, 6th, 5th-ish, probably not, probably not even 6th. I mean, if we lose out in order to get six, we would need Buffalo, the Giants, Tampa, Detroit, and Atlanta to all uh, win a game. Very good chance most of those teams are not going to win any more games. Otherwise, we would need Jacksonville, San Francisco, and the Jets to win two games. Very unlikely any of those teams win two games. So that's, that's the difference. That was the difference between winning and losing to Atlanta. We would be sitting at the number six spot. And it's just going to get worse from here. We could drop as low as 15 with a win against the Jets. Suddenly, in in a season in which the Green Bay Packers are rock bottom and can't beat anybody, we're drafting as though we're a mediocre team. We're not! Another win after that could put us at 18th. Again, not very likely because we're looking at a bunch of teams that all need to lose, but we're probably going to end up being 15, 16, 17 if we keep winning. So anyways, I just wanted to mention that. Again, I'm, I'm I'm looking at all the scenarios and what's good and what's bad, and it's just all bad. It's just all bad. A, a playing Aaron Rodgers and winning is horrible. Playing Kaiser and winning, I I don't know, at least, I guess, I guess, I don't even know if that's better or worse. I have no idea. I guess it's a little better because then it makes everybody else look good, right? Because you're kind of expected to lose and it's on the road and we snap that losing streak on the road and I don't know. Plus, you're not risking hurting Aaron Rodgers. It, it, it's at least a little bit of a spark. Like, hey, Kaiser, cool, man. We got a decent backup here, and everybody else stepped up in the midst of Rodgers being out. But it's that's as good as it gets, I think. Benching Rodgers and winning. I, I As far as winning goes, that's the best case. It, there, there's just nothing, man. It's just, I got nothing. But again, that was just another angle. It's going to be real bad if we play Aaron Rodgers and lose to the Jets. It's going to be real. If you think that things carry over into next year and you're worried about chemistry and all that stuff and how that's going to carry over, think about the carryover that's going to happen when Aaron Rodgers loses to the Jets. Moving on. So first things first, um, Kenny Clark and Aaron Jones have officially been placed on IR. This defense without Aaron or without uh, Kenny Clark is just, it's just not good. I mean, we saw one of the worst run defense performances, one of the worst tackling performances, one of the worst defensive performances in general without him. And don't forget, we already lost Mike Daniels. A couple of the, the younger guys are stepping up, but you got to understand, when we talk about Tyler Lancaster and people kind of giving him a round of applause, he's exceeding expectations, but he's still just... I mean, he's exceeding expectations for what you would expect from Tyler Lancaster. This is a very big drop-off um, currently with Dean Lowry and Tyler Lancaster and whoever. Uh, Montravius compared to, you know, Kenny Clark and Mike Daniels and Dean Lowry or whatever. So that's rough. Um, outside linebackers, we already lost Perry. So we've got Clay and Fackrell. Corners, we've already lost King. Safeties, we lost Haha and Whitehead and Green. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's it's just bare bones. But anyways, uh, two more guys now on IR. Our running backs are basically Jamal Williams because we shipped off Ty Montgomery and and Aaron Jones is is back on IR just like last year. Beyond that, we also placed tight end Ethan Wolf on the practice squad injured list. So with all the reshuffling, then we had to go out and uh, make some moves, and so we did. Uh, the first thing we did actually was yesterday. Running back Capri Bibbs was claimed off waivers from the Washington Redskins. Uh, a relatively obvious move considering the lack of depth that we have. Uh, one of the benefits of Bibbs, who is 5'11", 203, again, pretty standard Packers running back, a little smaller than usual, 203, usually they like to get up into the 220s, but 5'11", is just right on point, but he's been around for a long time, started off with Denver in 2014, he was there s- until 2016, 2017, he's with the San Francisco 49ers, 2018, Washington, and now he's with the Green Bay Packers. 
So he's he's not super big. Uh, he runs for, or ran four six seven at the combine. Twenty six years old. He's about as average as you can get. I mean, he he, he kind of flashes in pass blocking, but he can also be pretty terrible as a pass blocker. I mean, you have to assume this is about as classic of a you know take what the defense gives you and go down kind of running back as you're going to get. Right, two yards and down, three yards and down, kind of what we went through as Packer fans for a long time because we're just kind of shuffling running backs and getting whoever and whatever. Capri Bibbs is a body, and that's it. There's been, again, a relatively large sample size, and so there really isn't much expectation. I know sometimes fans kind of get all excited when we sign somebody, like, ooh, maybe he's a freak. Teams don't just let freaks walk, right? If, if we just nab him from a team, you can't just claim a guy that's a freak and is starting for a team. Like, that Kamara guy's pretty good. I think we'll take him. Excuse me, Saints. We'll have Kamara now, thank you. Yes, could you pass me the Kamara? That's not how that works. So, basically, he's a body. He's not very good, which I don't think Gutekunst cares all that much, <laughs> to be completely honest. Again, just, just going out and getting bodies. No big deal. The next day, we went and worked out a bunch of different players, and um, actually, there were six of them. Next day, meaning yesterday. If I, if I said yesterday for Capri, I meant two days ago. Yesterday was the other day. So yesterday we worked out first and foremost quarterback Paxton Lynch. Caused my uh, ears to perk up a little bit because it's very uncharacteristic for the Packers to be working out quarterbacks, especially quarterbacks that are kind of known, you know, backup quality. It seems like the kind of guy that you would sign if, I don't know, you were kind of in a pinch at quarterback, like if maybe you were going to put your quarterback in IR, that kind of a thing. I don't know, I'm just saying. Especially for a team that's kind of, you feel like they've got their quarterback room set a little bit. Maybe you're looking to replace your number three. We're obviously not moving on from Kaiser. So it's just one of those things. It's basically one of two things in my mind, especially at this point. Either they're looking at putting Rodgers on IR or even potentially doing it, which doesn't seem to be the indication at this point. Or this is just like every other workout where it's just we talk to our pro personnel and I, we say, you know, we just we need to fill out some spots because some people are hurt. Give me a list. Paxton Lynch was on that list and just happens to be a quarterback, and they're like, all right, whatever, bring him in. But, um, yeah, I mean, he, he's just another guy. He was a first-round draft pick, so it's it's one of those things similar to Kaiser where it's like the production is terrible, but, I mean, there's a lot of potential here. Six foot seven, big dude. But 2016-2017 uh, with the Denver Broncos were pretty terrible. But it's, you know, again, he's a first-round draft pick for a reason. There's talent in there somewhere. Production obviously doesn't match. It couldn't hurt to bring him in, try him out. See what happens. Hey, if we can replace, uh, you know, just put him as our number three. We've got three first-round draft pick quarterbacks. We got Aaron Rodgers, we got Deshaun Kaiser, and now we got Paxton Lynch. Somebody's bound to not be terrible, right? It's not going to cost us any money, anyways. We also worked out a couple different wide receivers: Chris Brown and Karun White. Karan White, Karan White. I don't know. It's A. A. Ron. I don't know what his name is. Uh, Chris Brown. He's been around for a little bit of a while. He's never actually made it into the regular season. He's been, uh, you know, preseason guy from 2016, 2017. 6'1", 195, free agent picked up by Dallas, playing for Cincinnati this year. Again, pretty much nothing special here, which is what you get at this time of the year. Similar story with Mr. K. Ron White, uh, 6'1", 200 pounds, free agent picked up by Seattle, didn't play outside of the preseason. He was terrible in preseason. There you go. Uh, otherwise, Eric Cotton, defensive end, and then two cornerbacks, DJ Killings and uh, Trayvon Mathis at cornerback. Of that group, uh, the Packers did decide to pick up the uh, defensive end, Eric Cotton, and the cornerback, DJ Killings. Cotton, it looks like, is kind of an unusual signing because I don't believe he made it with a team. He didn't get drafted. He didn't get picked up in free agency. So Packers dive in real deep here. I mean, it, it kind of goes to show how bad it is out there right now. When you've got guys that made it in the NFL, you got some guys that were even drafted that they're looking at and going, eh, I don't know. And it's so bad that they're diving deep and going back and looking at some of those free agents that they didn't even bother to call after the draft, like Eric Cotton, who didn't get anybody to call or get anyone to officially pick him up. They called him back and they're like, hey, you want to come work out? He worked out, and apparently he's still been working out trying to get on a team because he's now playing for the Packers. But he's 6'4", 272. He was a tight end for Stanford, made the switch over to defensive end. It's kind of a weird pickup for the Packers. I don't exactly know where he fits. He's very, very big for an out. I mean, I, 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 what do you do with him? you got to put him at defensive tackle, right? But at 272, that's pretty small. 
And I don't think a guy that doesn't even get called to get put on a team who's 272 pounds is going to be able to make the switch from defensive end to outside linebacker and be able to do anything. But whatever, it doesn't matter. He's not going to play anywhere. DJ Killings, I mean, well, whatever, it doesn't matter. He's a 2017 undrafted free agent picked up by the Patriots, went over to Philly. Preseason guy only. Actually did pretty well in the preseason for New England. Not very well. I shouldn't say that. Decent tackler. Terrible coverage for Philly. Now he's with us. He's probably not going to be doing anything, and he's just here to fill a spot. But uh, welcome to Green Bay, my friend. Uh, the, the other big signing everybody wants to talk about is Mr. Alan Lazard. I believe is how you spell it, or say his name, not Lazard. Could be wrong. I do remember him from last year, and I remember having to adjust how I said his name. I, I, I just I really don't like the signing, not like I'm supposed to, because he's not really going to contribute. I do remember him being um, somewhat highly touted. I want to say like fourth, fifth round-ish prospect. He ended up getting undrafted. A lot of people saying he's 6'6". I don't believe he is. He's somewhere between 6'4 and 6'5", depending who you ask. Packers have him listed at 6'5", 227, so I'm good with that. But part of what I don't like is I'm just kind of getting tired of... I mean, these guys who just are really physically impressive, right? We got, you know, six foot six, um, Jimmy Graham. We got six five, Lazard. We got six five, I think Marquez, six four, or maybe it's EQ, whatever. Six four EQ, six three Jamon. Some of these guys are running four fours, four threes. I mean, the, the the bottom line with Alan Lazard is he's he's basically, I I don't know. He's basically a 50-50 ball guy. He's, he's kind of what Jimmy Graham was supposed to be, maybe. Like, his upside is what Jimmy Graham was supposed to be, which is, at his age, you just run somewhere, and then we throw it up, and you just catch it instead of the other guy. He can't, he can't separate. As big and as strong as he is, he can't even get off press coverage. He doesn't have any ability to run routes. He's too stiff-legged. He doesn't have enough speed to beat you deep. I mean, he's just he's just kind of plod, you know, he's a red zone guy. Plod your way into the red zone, stand there, try to box somebody out, and then catch it. But again, it doesn't matter. Maybe he can come in and compete, because why not? I mean, it's not not a lot of guarantees at the wide receiver spot at this point. But um, anyways, those are the roster moves. I think uh, Bibbs is going to be the one guy that we might actually see. Lazard, I don't know. I suppose if we're going to treat these like preseason games, why not give him a shot? Otherwise, nothing all too spectacular. But lots of things nonetheless. It's kind of exciting either way. I mean, it's 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 anticlimactic when you actually look into him. I was actually excited because I knew his name, Alan Lazard, and it's like, ooh, or Lazard. It's like, oh, I remember him. And then you look into him like, oh, yeah, I remember him. <laughs> but anyways, time is winding down for me. i got to get flying here. So let's talk about the playoff picture as it stands right now. Um, if you look at it currently... Um, first, the first thing that stands out is the Patriots aren't getting a bye, which is hilarious. Could change, but it makes me very happy. Thank you, Texans and Chiefs. I would love nothing more than to see, um, well, currently the Bears and Vikings are playing each other, but if we can, if we can have a scenario in which the Bears and the Vikings and the Patriots, probably the Saints isn't going to happen, but I won't get too greedy. I'll just say the Bears, the Vikings, and the Patriots all get knocked out in the, uh, in the wild card. Oh, that would be the best That'd be the best thing that happened this year in football. That would be the best thing, literally. Like, nothing happened this year that was more awesome than that. But anyways, as it stands in the AFC, you got uh, the Chiefs number one, Texans number two seed. You've got the Patriots, the number three, Baltimore's number six, so it would be Patriots-Baltimore at this point. And then the fifth and sixth, or the fourth and fifth seed are the Steelers and the uh, LA uh, Chargers. In the NFC, number one seed is the Saints, number two are the Rams, then your sixth and third seed would be Bears Vikings. Your fourth and fifth seed would be Cowboys Seahawks. Minnesota still very tentative being in with a being a seven win team. The only reason they are is because some of the other seven win teams, like the Washington Redskins and Philadelphia Eagles, are seven and seven. Vikings are seven six and one. So I'm also a very big uh, Philadelphia Eagles slash Washington Redskins fan because they could actually keep the Vikings out to begin with. And how pathetic is the NFC? Eight and six Cowboys, eight and six Seattle, seven six and one Minnesota Vikings. Ugh. Anyways, let's get started here. I want to look at the NFC primarily. If there's time, we'll get to the AFC. It maybe doesn't matter all that much, but let's at least start with the Saints, the number one seed overall. So currently, if you look at the rankings um, as it stands, the Rams are the number one team. This is this is just overall grade for pro football focus. And again, the thing that's important and it's why we're going to dig in a little deeper is because it's averaged out. They don't weighted heavier toward the end of the year so the beginning of the year 
also factors in. So if you're sliding a little bit, you're not really going to know. If you're kind of on the rise, you might be lower than whatever. But it's basically, this is the order. The Rams, the Saints, the Chiefs, the Patriots, the Chargers, the Bears, the Texans, the Colts, the Vikings, the Titans, the Eagles, and whatever. It just goes from there. So the Saints are number two. Here's the thing that's interesting, though. If you look at the Saints' defense, they started off the season not so hot. I mean, pretty below average, average-ish, whatever. Since week 10, a, f- a switch was flipped. Right now, even with half their season being not too great at defense, they're graded as the fourth best defense in the NFL, tied with the New England Patriots. Just barely below the Rams. Just a a hair behind the Texans. I mean, again, the Bears are the only ones that kind of stand out here. But if you just look from week 10 to week 15, they have been on an absolute tear. Their grades have been incredible. And if you look at the points scored against them, 14, 7, 17, 13, 14, and 9. Their offense also, by the way, which has tapered off the last three weeks, but starting in week 10, kind of took off. So we know the offense is very explosive, but the defense has really, really, really kicked it up. And who knows if this is going to be sustainable. Things change. You know, it can change multiple times in a season. But at this point, you're looking at one of the best offenses, which now has a defense, which is one of the best defenses in the NFL. I mean, if we're just looking at since week 10, I mean, this is, I, I would assume, hands down the best team in the NFL. So that's going to be the biggest factor, I think, for the Saints. Uh, Not regressing on offense, which probably is just going to mean no injuries, but can the defense sustain this? Because the biggest thing for if you actually want to win a Super Bowl, you got to have that defense. There has to be some offense, like we saw with the Jaguars. If you have no offense, you're kind of out of it. But defense does win championships. That's been a steady model since forever. If your defense is garbage, you're just not going to win it. Now, if we flip over to the Rams, we're talking about a, a very, very different situation. So the Rams' defense started off not too bad. If you look at them through Week 7, their defense was almost entirely good, even including Week 8 when they played the Packers. It was basically good, with two elite games mixed in against the 49ers and the Cardinals. Since then, starting in Week 9, their defense kind of tapered off a little bit. Weeks weeks 9, 10, 11, and 13 after their bye, not good at all. We're talking barely average to below average defense. That is a recipe for disaster. Now, the good news is... Weeks 14 and 15 against the Bears and the Eagles, their defense really kicked it up. They had two really good weeks on defense. Here's the problem. Since week 13, their passing grade, their overall offensive grade, but primarily because of the passing, has been abysmal. I don't know what's going on. I have no idea what is going on with Jared Goff. I don't know. I'm not a Rams fan. But this is a guy who was one of the best quarterbacks in 2018. I mean, we're talking one, two, three elite games. We're talking two very good games. We're talking one, two, three, four good games. His only below average game was against the Oakland Raiders, 57.8. Against 60 is average, so 57.8 is basically rated average. Against Detroit, Chicago, and Philadelphia, he's been in the 40s. The 40s. He has been, I would be willing to bet, the worst quarterback in football the last three weeks in a row. I have no clue what is going on. But something is very, very wrong with the Rams. And by the way, I don't know if you saw on Twitter, I posted something about, uh, who was it, Marcus Peters going up and starting to get lippy at a fan. You're starting to see Sean McVay's demeanor change a little bit. What have I said about high volatility players? As a matter of fact, I told you to keep an eye on the Rams because I could see them breaking apart at the seams. I said, watch what happens when they start to lose. They've lost two in a row. Remember, I told you this. I said, if, if this team continues to win, they're fine. Look, think about the, the Panthers when they went undefeated, or, or uh, you know, they, they only lost one game. Exact same situation through Week 13 with the Rams. Of course, everything's great, and Cam Newton's awesome, and everything's fantastic, and now they've lost two in a row, and they're breaking apart at the seams. Their offense, which is their calling card, this elite offense, has been really bad for three weeks in a row. And it's all centered around their rookie stud quarterback who's playing like absolute trash. And now you've got these free agent defenders that they went out and spent big money on. You got Aqib Tlaib, you got Peters, you got Indomit and Sue, and all these guys are talented, kind of end of the career, some of them. They they're, they got high upside talent, but very, very high volatility. And Peters is having a terrible year. So suddenly you get that emotion that really rides that ride high. It's really going to crash if they keep losing. Now, they're playing the Cardinals and 49ers. So they've got an opportunity to rebound here because as bad as they've been, it's, it's really unlikely. But I'll tell you right now, if they lose to the Cardinals, this thing is officially unraveled and it's game over. 
they got an opportunity because, again, winning fixes everything. I know these are kind of trash teams. We'll see what happens. Uh, it's possible if it's real close between these two teams, the media narrative is real bad, and then the Rams just, you know, again, it's it's all about emotion with that team. But um, at this point, Rams are not my favorite. I don't know if they're my second, third, fourth. I don't know what they are. We'll, we'll keep going, but this is pretty ugly. Yeah, maybe we'll do AFC tomorrow because it's just it's not going to work. Anyways, taking a look at the third seed, Chicago Bears. Currently, as you know, they are the number one defense. Unfortunately, they are graded as the number 26 offense, and that's going to be the biggest problem for them going forward. And um, the, the biggest thing with the Bears, and I don't know if this is good or bad, but it, it's really, 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 really consistent. Not a lot has changed. Maybe you can make a case that the coverage has, has really, really improved. Uh, the, the coverage unit was, I mean, they, they had a, a mediocre game in week one against the Packers, uh, average game against uh, the Bucks in week four, uh, average against the Dolphins, really bad against the Patriots. Since then, they, they've been pretty solid. But they had two really good weeks against the Seahawks and the Cardinals as well. But maybe you could make the case that the coverage unit has really, really stepped up. Otherwise, it's pretty consistent everywhere across the board. Run defense has been good all year. Tackling has been pretty good all year. Uh, pass rush, actually not all that impressive. They flash at times. But, you know, again, obviously everybody knows Khalil Mack is the man. But anyways, run defense, really, really good. Defense as a whole, really, really good. Offense, run blocking has been bad all year. Running the football, actually, running the football is something that maybe actually got a little bit worse. They were never actually all that great at it, but I would say they were probably above average to good through week nine. Since then, they've been consistently below average. The only game above average all year since week nine has been week 14 against the Rams. Uh, Since then, below average against the Lions, the Vikings, barely average against the Lions, abysmal game against the Giants, and then below average again against the Packers. Uh, Receiving has been pretty consistent. Pass blocking has been really good all year. Maybe a little bit worse. Not bad, but, you know, they started off really, really good, and things are slowly starting to dwindle a little bit. You could also look at the, the passing as maybe getting a little bit better just because, although it's still not good and he had a terrible game against the Rams, since week 10, that's really the only bad game. Everything else has been either average or above, which is pretty encouraging, especially if you're going into the final stretch, because prior to week 10, you had abysmal, below average, abysmal, below average, elite, abysmal, below average, below average. So really, through weeks 9, they had, he had one just flukishly, freakish game against the Buccaneers where they scored 48 points, and Trubisky just went absolutely insane. But everything else was trash. Since week 10, he's only had one bad game, and that was against the Rams. So... That could be actually a pretty big thing since Trubisky kind of, it's kind of the big thing, right, for the for the Bears. Not only do they need a better offense, but they're going to need primarily Trubisky to step up. Going to be a little bit encouraging there, not for us, but for them. But I would say they're just relatively consistent. And as long as they stay consistent, I think we're okay because I don't think this team is good enough. I know they have a good defense, but again, 22 points typically is all you need to beat the Bears. That held true against the Packers as well. We scored 17, we lost. The last time they lost, they lost to the Jets. The Jets scored 30. Scored more than 22 points, and you beat the Bears. And we're talking about even the Rams, who I know are falling apart, but if they can get that going again, we're talking about the Saints. We're talking about a lot of teams. 22 points is reasonable. Moving on to the number four seed, the Dallas Cowboys. A lot of volatility with this team. Currently, overall, they're rated 16th, but again, it's hard to gauge. What up? Yeah, I know. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. I can't dance right now. But uh, 16th overall. Offense for the season is 17th. Defense for the season is 13th. So overall, not very good. But again, let's take a closer look. So the big claim is that Amari Cooper has really helped the team. I mean, it's kind of a stretch. If we're just looking at receiving as a group, as a unit, I'm I'm sure Amari is by himself an upgrade. You could make the case, but it's a little bit of a stretch. They've been relatively consistent as a receiving unit. Um, I think they've been, this is this is unusually consistent, actually, compared to what I was expecting. Uh, the, the offense has been very consistently average to to good. You know, we're talking like 60s-ish. They've, they've really only had one below average game. They have not had a one single very good game. Not one in the 80s, not one in the 90s. They, they've, they've had one that was 58. So, I mean, this, this is very consistent and boring. Uh, the, the one big thing to note here, Dak Prescott, the passing grade has fallen off um, pretty much since week nine. So if you look at weeks one through seven prior to their bye, week one wasn't good, and then two, three, four, five, six, and seven were all pretty good games. Since then, 
against Tennessee below average, against the Eagles below average, two decent games against the Falcons and Redskins, and then pretty poor grades against the Saints, the Eagles, and the Colts. They did squeak out a win against the Eagles just barely. They beat the Saints just barely, but they lost to the Colts 23-0. to uh, You could maybe make an argument that the defense is getting better. I think maybe this is a slightly overhyped defense. They had a, obviously an incredible performance against the New Orleans Saints, but that was that was one of two games that really stood out as being good. The other was against the Jacksonville Jaguars when they scored when they only allowed seven points. Otherwise, it's I mean it's just this is this is the Cowboys in a nutshell. This is kind of how I've always viewed them. They're they're just a steady, solid team. They're not elite, but they're solid. And it's it's not a bad thing for the playoffs to just be kind of solid because you can pick apart teams that have kind of high volatility. I mean, this is a team that could upset the Rams if the Rams just can't really get it together and they're acting a little crazy. I could see that happening. They're a team that could upset the. I mean, they, they they could upset a lot of people. I just don't know if this is a team that's good enough to win out completely, because at some point somebody's going to give you their best, right? The the one team that just can't get it together, like the Packers consistently do in the playoffs, where the defense falls apart. Dallas is the kind of team that's not going to fall apart. They're just going to steamroll that team. But you get the Saints at their best, it's just not going to happen. Yes, I know they beat their beat the Saints. But the Saints scoring 10 points is not the Saints at their best. So as far as grades go, it, it's been actually really consistent. So when when their overall grade says that they're 16th, pretty pretty solid because it's, you know, just kind of what they've been. Looking at the fifth seed Seattle Seahawks, can definitely make a case that starting around week 11 against the Packers, the offense kind of stepped it up a little bit. Not by a lot. I mean, basically here's what happened. Two, two weeks were pretty bad. Then from weeks three to weeks eight were pretty good. Then they had another two bad weeks, and then since week 11, they've been pretty solid. Uh, Russell Wilson has had probably some of his best games. I mean, Detroit was just out of control. He was almost great. He had a 98.1, so basically almost perfect, which is ridiculous. Uh, But uh, very good game against the Packers, very good against the Panthers, very good against the 49ers. He had one real bad blip against the Vikings. They still somehow managed to win that game, probably because their defense allowed the Vikings to score seven points. But... um, yeah, I would say the offense is kind of in a good rhythm here. Not a whole lot else step, you know, sticking out. You could make a case for a couple other things like run defense, but it's just been incredibly inconsistent. I mean, you you look at uh, against the Broncos in Week One was a bad game. Against the Bears, a good game. Against the Cowboys, a bad game. Against the Cardinals, an elite game. Against the Rams, average. Against the Raiders, good. Against the Lions, very good. Against the Chargers, average. Against the Rams, really bad. So it's just it's real up and down. So they've had a good three out of the last four weeks, so you can kind of say that, but I, I think if you take a clip anywhere of four games, you can make a case for really good or really bad. So I don't expect that to necessarily be a trend. So, you know, I mean, this is this is a kind of a high-volatility team. The the offense is stepping up, which is good, but, uh, you know, I, I don't expect too much from Seattle because, again, this is another team. You know, once you get into the playoffs, you need that Dallas Cowboys consistency, but you need it at kind of a higher level. I think the Saints have that. They have the, the relative consistency – but also the high level of play. Seattle's too inconsistent. I mean, they're, they're, they're winning, and that's great, but you see how they kind of fell apart against the Vikings, but lost because the Vikings fell apart worse. They lost to the 49ers, which is really, really pathetic. You know, they, they won before that, but they beat, you know, the 49ers. Who cares? They beat the Panthers and barely. They beat the Packers and barely, and the Packers are not good. The Panthers are not good. It may have felt like something when you beat the Packers and Panthers at the time, but you didn't realize the Packers and Panthers were both going to go on an absolute losing streak since then. So not a whole lot to hang your hat on here. They have not played a good team since probably the Rams in Week 10, and they got beat by the Rams. Before that, they played the Chargers. They got beat by the Chargers. So I mean, it's just, what good teams did they beat? Before that, they beat the Lions and the Raiders. Both are trash. They beat, played the Rams again. They lost. They beat the Cardinals, who are trash. They beat the Cowboys in Week 3 when they weren't good. They played the Bears and lost, the Broncos and lost. I mean, they haven't really beat a good team. They could try to hang their hat on the Vikings if they want to, but, I mean, come on just not buying it. I'm not seeing it for Seattle, which isn't good because again, I'm looking for as many teams as we can possibly find to beat these other teams as is possible. Somebody needs to beat the Vikings. Somebody needs to beat the Bears. And I'm not seeing a lot of people that can actually do that outside of the Saints. We just need the Saints to just go nuts. And the problem is we have their draft pick. I need them to lose too. I guess I'm a huge Rams fan. I don't know. Cowboys. I don't want the Cowboys to do well. I don't like the Seahawks. This is a nightmare. I mean, I do, do, do we want Philly to get in and win it again? I don't like Philadelphia. I hate their fans. They're the worst fans ever. I guess I don't mind the Eagles, but I don't want their fans the satisfaction of getting two in a row. Would make for a good story, though, with uh, Carson Wentz going down. Anyways, uh, Minnesota Vikings are the final team. Um, very, very good game against Miami. It kind of is getting a lot of people to say maybe they turned a corner. Maybe. 
because it was a complete game, right? The, I think the defense looked pretty solid. I think the offense looked really good. But if you just go back one week to the Seahawks, it was terrible. Kirk Cousins was absolute garbage. And Kirk Cousins has had good games. This wasn't even his best game. He had a great game against the New Orleans Saints. He had a good game against the Eagles. He had a good game against the Rams. He had a he was graded as elite against the Packers in week two, obviously. So, you know, you get a lot of up and down, but all right, let's take it one at a time here. So the offense has been relatively consistent. This was graded out as one of their best games. I would say I think it's their third best. But, you know, the two prior were pretty bad. If you look at, you know, the last four prior, three of the last four were not great. The Bears, the Patriots, and the Seahawks were all pretty bad. Same thing with Kirk Cousins. It follows that exact same path. You know, three out of the prior four were pretty bad. Obviously, their run blocking is not great. Uh, You could make a case pass blocking is, is stepping up, and maybe that's what's helping Cousins. I don't really know. But again, it's really small sample size, so it's hard to call that a trend. I think their receivers have been relatively consistent. Again, two bad games against the Seahawks and Patriots, but they bounced back against uh, Miami. If you look at weeks four through week 12, they were consistently pretty solid, so I would expect them to be pretty solid down the stretch. I think the biggest thing has been running the football. Um, They've been pretty terrible all year. Um, The last three games, if you look at the Patriots and the Dolphins uh, in particular, they were graded as almost elite. So that's something that they really needed and really wanted. Despite the run blocking, it's starting to step up. The Seahawks was not nearly as impressive, and if you look at the Packers, it was absolutely horrible. But if they can get the run game going, you know, it could make a pretty big difference. I don't know if it's like the difference between being basically too trash to get into the playoffs because your record is trash and being a Super Bowl champion, you know, because you can run the football. But, uh, you know, something. Um, on On the flip side, though, the defense is probably a little bit concerning. The defense started off the season pretty poorly. Starting in week 6 through, we'll call it week 11, defense really ramped it up. Really solid defense, pretty much all predicated on the run defense looking really good. But then it started to dwindle. They had a good game against the the Packers, uh, average game against the Patriots, average game against the Seahawks, and then a pretty good game against the Dolphins. So the last four weeks have not been that great. This is not the Minnesota Vikings defense they need to go into the playoffs. They need the, you know... Week 6, 7, 9, and 11. They need that team, in particular the run defense. Run defense since week 12 against the Packers was good. Against uh, the Patriots was average. Against the Seahawks was below average. Against the Dolphins was average. So that's kind of a staple of that defense. They need that to kind of ramp back up if they're going to have any chance whatsoever of even getting into the playoffs, much less, you know, making a run in the playoffs. Otherwise, everything's pretty consistent. The coverage is just kind of meh. Pass rush is maybe a little bit better. I don't know, but everything else is pretty consistent. So they're running the ball a little bit better. The defense really needs to step it up. Kirk Cousins needs more consistency. He had one good game, but he hasn't been good for a while since then. I mean, his last game that was as good as it was against Miami was week eight against the Saints. So to look at one game and say, whoa, I think we got to figure it out. Well, let's see what happens against the Lions and the Bears before we get too jacked up here. So basically, when I'm looking at this, the Saints stand alone. Uh, the Saints are, are completely by themselves. The Rams probably have the most talent outside of the Saints, but are, you know, they're they're on they're on watch right now. Uh, they get they have two really easy opponents that can hopefully spark them back up because I want them to be dominant again, please. Uh, if you look at the Bears, the concern is the offense. Obviously, the defense is still top tier. The uh, Dallas Cowboys are consistent, but I don't know if they have the top end talent. Seattle Seahawks need some more consistency, um, and I, I just don't really like them all that much. Even even if they find consistency, I don't know how good they are. I feel like if, if they were more consistent, they would be more like the Dallas Cowboys. They're, they're like a less consistent Cowboys. And then the Vikings, I think, are somewhat of a high upside team if you look at how good the running back... I mean, if, if everything was, was clicking, like all at the same time and for an entire offseason, very high upside. We know how good their defense can be. Uh, they finally found a running game. Kirk Cousins can be very good. Wide receivers can be very good. But the lack of consistency through the year doesn't inspire a lot of hope that they're going to be able to do very much. But high upside team, high volatility team. We'll see. I don't know. I, don't, I, I was hoping that would uh, yield some better results as far as inspiring confidence. But just looking at the lack of talent in the NFC, and things are things can and will change, right? It just takes one completely trash game to lose. But if I had to rank them, the, the Saints are number one by a long shot. The Bears might be number two. 
than the Rams number three just because, you know, they should be number two, possibly number one, but just because of the, I don't know, I'm going to put them number three. Then probably the Cowboys, then maybe Minnesota just because of the high upside, and then maybe Seattle. It's hard to gauge because if you're just looking at talent, it's going to be a different different order, but you got to kind of take into account, you know, we're talking about the playoffs, meaning can you be consistent? So if you're inconsistent, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. So anyways, I thought it was fun to kind of look at that see what teams are doing down the stretch as opposed to you know what the narrative is even though a lot of the narrative i guess is kind of holding true but anyways i got to fly you folks have a great day i'll talk to you tomorrow bye bye